live on YouTube. I can. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Smart Brown Girl live chat. And we are just uh, doing a check to see if we are live. And I can check to see if we're live on Facebook. We are. We are live on Facebook. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's get going. So I am Dr. Danisha Blake, and I am a fairly recent uh, addition to the syllabi cohort. And uh, Brie, I'll let you introduce me. I'm Brie Reed. Um, I don't even, I don't even know the stages. I've been in the cohort for a little minute, though. It's been a great time with everybody across Facebook, YouTube, um, and our other platforms, especially as we get into some reads that are pretty timely for a time that I believe so many of us didn't expect to draw on for mm -hmm. so long. <laughs> Exactly. So we're just going to give like an informal or have an informal conversation about why we think Pleasure Activism by Adrian Marie Brown is a good read for this time. And uh, hello. Hi. Um, and yeah, we're just going to shoot the shoot the shit for a minute and kind of yeah. try to compel you to actually buy the syllabus and also check out the book. Yeah, so I think that's the first thing. Before we get into the specific book, I think there's a lot of um, confusion about the different tracks uh -huh. of the book club. So we have our general reads and then we have our complex theory. And I think the term complex theory scares a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I think for folk who might not be engaged in academia, who might not be in an academic intellectual space. Theory alone can be intimidating, but to add the word complex on it really <laughs> makes it feel heavier than I think any of us intended it for it to be. Right. Um, yeah, so if you want to speak to yeah, like how, I, yeah, yeah, how you engage with theory. Yeah, I was, I was looking at that thread that we had and where Julesy was asking, and I think like some of the, one of, I think Alana said, um, that she kind of thinks of it as sort of an exploration of um, Black feminism or something that goes in a little deep. I mean, I think that all the works that we read, whether it be fiction, nonfiction, um, sort of theory, because I think if we think about theory as a way of knowing and a way of understanding the world, um, then I think that everyone is providing a narrative that kind of connects in that way. So um, for me, I think the the complex theory, we can see it all over the place. Um, we can see theory everywhere, but uh, really in these books, I think that exploration or that deep dive, some folks were saying deep dive, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was a cool term to use to break down um, the, the, tra the different tracks. Someone said an accelerated track, but I don't know. I feel like that's kind of seems like more like the pace. Yeah. Instead of like the depth. And I think this one, I think we're trying to capture something that deals with the depth of the room. Yeah. So. Um, somebody else said it was intimidating for me. I thought complex theory would be a hard read, but they talk themselves into reading Patricia Hill Collins. I'm so nice. glad that you read Black Feminist Thought along with this. Yeah. Um, I think Black Feminist Thought is one text in particular that sort of encapsulates what we mean mm -hmm. to get at when we pick different complex theory reads. It's not about the the language or a lot of people say academic jargon, and it's not a space for us to get bogged down with terms, right. but really look at the ways that we can apply these texts to our lived experience. And I think that's another problem with the language of the tracks is that we can't do fiction and nonfiction because mm -hmm. we read nonfiction texts for our general reads. Um, exactly. And we explore different genres in our general reads. So that really doesn't get to it. But I think you're absolutely right in that what the complex theory is hoping to get at is a different line of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and those books are definitely more in the scope of intellectual history. So maybe intellectual history could be a different title or something like that. Um, but for folks who are saying they're intimidated, please don't be intimidated by the complex yeah. theory. 
um, All About Love, Black Feminist Thought, and Now Pleasure Activism are some great books by some phenomenal Black women, Black thinkers. Um, and I would invite you all into this space to learn with us, picking up the syllabi for pleasure activism, go back and get the syllabi for Black Feminist Thought and All About Love, yeah. and really take the time to, to struggle through theory um, because I think that is another misconception. People think that you have to pick up on theory the first time, and that's just not, that's just not it. Chelsea said, probably going with the exploration track. So, yeah, I think that's a great uh, way to. And, you know, I was going to say um, I lost my train of thought, so we'll just keep going. Um, and we do provide oh. supplementary text through the oh. syllabi. So yeah. I know at the end of especially the complex theory syllabi, we give suggestions for further reading. Mm -hmm. We give suggestions of movies, shows, YouTube videos, other articles that you can read to really make connections to some of the themes. So that's another benefit to making sure you pick up the syllabi um, and read along with us and stay active in the Facebook group. The Facebook group comments feel like such a strong community for me mm -hmm. during quarantine especially with Parable of the Sower. I think somebody literally has a thread that's like, don't look at the comments. I'm right, like, I'm ready like, to spoil uh -huh. it. <laughs> I was like, you know what? You got it. I'm just going to pass it on by because I'm a little behind. And a lot of you all, I really want to empathize with you all because a lot of you all say you are behind in the readings or, you know, the timing of these uh, live discussions. So some of you all like do the replay and different things like that. Um, so we understand like a lot of you all are in school or have children who are in school. And so it becomes really difficult to join in. But if you can just put us on in the background, sometimes I, feel like <laughs> I, I cook and I put y'all on in the background. And okay. at some point I was just like, you, cause I used to do it when I watched you all, I would just have, I would be eating while I was doing it. Every time I would be like, Oh, I'm eating a burger. And then I'll be like, Oh, I'm eating something else. And then I'm like, no, they just don't, I just need to stop. I'm going to comment on what I'm eating today. <laughs> but that's how I did it. So, um, but yeah, join along and, um, but however you can play us in the background type, if, if you can, uh, Give us some comp some comments and comment along uh, if you are able to, please do. Of course. So getting into why we are reading Pleasure Activism. Pleasure Activism is such a multidimensional text. Yeah. It is a text that I think you can enter into from multiple points, whether you are engaged in movement work, whether you are a scholar, academic, intellectual, a teacher, a, a partner, right? Mm -hmm. These other functions that don't have to do with work also, if you're somebody who is looking into what does pleasure mean for you, which is my number one suggestion for reading this text, right? Because pleasure is a word that I think so many of us take for granted. Right. We make it such a malleable term, mm -hmm. which I think has benefits, but I think we also need to, to get precise and get some clear language around what does a pleasure politic look like? Um, and Brown does all of that in this text. Um, especially, I read Pleasure Activism first, and then I went back wow. and got, I believe this is her first book, Emerging yeah. Strategy, yeah. which is so, so popular um, in movement work. Yep. And I think it's a part of a three kind of part series of emergent strategies. So there's a there's one that she just put out to, I think it's on transformative justice uh, mm -hmm. came out a few weeks ago. So I think this is that one was the third in this series under emergent strategy. Um, one of the things that I thought about is like sometimes we think about pleasure, um, and we think about it. There's like a le there's like levels to it. So like I think that what I really appreciate about pleasure activism is it really goes there and allows mm -hmm. us to engage in like the things that are that are uncomfortable but that are also like pleasurable. So mm -hmm. chance to kind of talk about, you know, for some people, polyamory is is a really like touchy subject, or we're talking about drug use or um, we're talking about, you know, uh, celibacy, like some things that people kind of go like, okay, like I can touch on it. It's there <laughs> in my life, but I really don't want to go deep Hard on it. Like, yeah, let's gloss over it. And yeah. hi Taylor watching on YouTube. Oh yes. The new book is we will not cancel us. And I think oh, okay. it's being produced. I think 
We Will Not Cancel Us might be the third in Brown's series. And I think the oh. publisher also expanded it to other authors. Oh, okay. Um, so I think Alexis Pauline Gums is another author who's going to be included. And that's exactly right. Like, pleasure activism brings everything to bear that deals with pleasure that some folks are weary of talking about for different reasons, mm -hmm. whether it be respectability, which is a large one, right? And Brown goes there and names that off the bat. Oh, yeah. Uh, we are conditioned in like this middle class, respectable framework. And if you do not live a life, that ascribes to those different scripts, then yep. finding pleasure becomes a tricky subject. Right. And it's hard to let go of that residue of respectability because mm. I, you know, like I'm, I spent six and a half years in, in graduate school, really engaging and interrogating respectability. And yet, and being around communities who were sort of pushing the limits. And yet I still find myself like, Ooh, like clutching my pearls when you hear <laughs> like that Sammy, which one was it where she did Sammy, Sammy Schultz? Where they like, I'm not gonna spoil it, but there was a, a part in there where I was like, okay, hold on, hold on now. Uh, I wasn't gonna that. <laughs> like, she was talking about her relationship with her friend, and like, I was like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not that. I'm not that elevated yet. Like I have to get to <laughs> you haven't reached that level of consciousness. Exactly. It's so you like, pleasure <laughs> politics. <laughs> so you know, I like I that exists in the world, and I want to support that. And I think, I think this is what it allows us to do: is say like these things exist in the world, and I think our thing is to keep it at arm's length when it doesn't make us comfortable. But like, mm. how do we like move into a space where we're like, I want to live, I want to support that. I want to make sure that we are reducing harm, even if that's not what I would personally engage with. And I'm not saying I wouldn't engage with it because it's wrong or it's like in the back of my, like, how can we get to that point where we're like, there's, we can release that sort of inclination and really be mm. like, I'm invested in you living in your full dignity even as that's not a choice for my life. And I think that gets to, so I chose a variety of different pieces. Pleasure activism is full of over 30 different pieces. So this mm -hmm. is an anthology text, which is another reason I thought it was perfect for complex theory, because again, as I said in the beginning, there's so many different points of access, right? Like Sammy Skulk is a disability justice scholar and advocate. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's a, a whole area of intellectualism, but also movement work that is very niche, but something that we should all be looking into as Sammy and Adrian tell us in the text. Um, and I love this text as it builds on past complex theory reads. Yes. Like I think there's something especially powerful about reading this after reading All About Love. Oh. Right? So the book club has been loving all about love and learning about love. And now that we're getting into um, a loving ethic and an ethic of care, how do we apply that to pleasure? So I mm -hmm. thought this was a perfect building block after all about love. And in particular, your comment just made me think of, oh, it's included in the syllabus. So I hop mm -hmm. around a few different subsections, but as it relates to harm reduction, that mm -hmm. interview, um, made me think of your point because they go there specifically mm -hmm. with harm reduction and what does it mean to give people healthy um, and guided access to drug use. Right. And that is a conversation that so many people in my family weren't ready to have when I first read this book. Mm -hmm. um, and a trigger warning for discussions of drug and drug use and addiction here for this yeah. section. Yeah. Um, not going to spoil too much, but definitely talking about those themes as I look back at the syllabus. So it's section four um, mm -hmm. is the politic of radical drug use. That is the section title and it's called Conditions of Possibility, a conversation with Monique Tula. And they talk about how we are alive and we are human beings. And part of that is living and experiencing different things. But because of different legislation, because of different societal norms, yeah. we have all been imbued to a certain degree to think that different things that certain communities do in particular are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely racialized, it's definitely classed. In certain parts of the United States even, it's mapped onto geographies. Um, and there are certain regions that do certain drugs. And how do we 
combat stigmas of drug use so that we can mm -hmm. all be healthy and well for what that means for us. Exactly. Yeah, I was just about to say that same point. It's like when we have to engage with like what is inherently bad, right? Like, you know, like I use, we have conversation about like criminalization. We, we're talking about a process that makes something criminal, right? And so mm -hmm. like how do you move from a space of being like, well, what is actually, you know, if they're not harming someone, like what is actually bad about that? And it's because we live in a system that says, these things, these certain behaviors, but we don't realize that those things are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And so like, how do we then go, okay, no, I don't really think that, you know, certain levels, if, cause I think what Adrian Marie Brown is saying is also like, if we're doing it safely, if we're providing access to, for people to do it and they're not causing harm to other folks, then, you know, can we look at different ways of supporting these communities? Yeah. And that interview with Moni Tula really gave me language for my personal lived experiences growing up in Baltimore City and having um, a familiarity with like on in the neighborhood where I grew up, there was um, a health care clinic mm -hmm. for harm reduction. Okay. Right. And I knew that different people in our community felt so strongly about having that there. They were like, oh, the types of people who go there and all of this very harmful language and harmful mm -hmm. demonization of people is something that I grew up around, like different people's reactions yeah. to seeing those services in community. And hearing Tula and Brown be in conversation and add so much language of experience to that. Yeah. And to have them, again, not to spoil it, but a nice tidbit of pleasure activism is how we take things on a metric Mm -hmm. Right. They talk about how we only talk about drug use in terms of complete addiction and sobriety. There's never a muddy middle mm -hmm. for harm reduction to intervene or for lived experiences to be talked about and discussed. You're either like a zero sum game. Right. <laughs> You've never touched a drug. You did the D.A.R.E. program when you were elementary school. You followed all the lessons. <laughs> Or you're like on beyond scale straight and right. your parents are trying to get you help and your community is deeply invested in your wellness. Right. Mm -hmm. In the ways that each part of this text connects to a larger system and structure. Mm -hmm. um, Adrian Marie Brown is brilliant at taking the individual, the micro level, and connecting it to the macro. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. And if you read Hood Feminism, I feel like you need to, like, I've mm -hmm. I, to your earlier point, like, these are things that, like, the forgot, when we talk about the forgotten or the, 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 the people that the movement forgot, I don't remember what the subtitle was um, or the after the colon part, but this is like another level. It's like, or, and I wouldn't even say it's a deeper dive, but it's a, it's a different area to go into our discomfort. Cause even when I read hood feminism, I was like, Oh, she calling me out. <laughs> no, I don't like you. It's the hand on the chin. Sit back. I was like, here for me. You know, look, because I'm like this black, I, I like do black feminism in the art world. And like, I'm like, ooh, mm. art and cultural production. And she's like, no, what about welfare and poverty? And like, yes, art can be a way to speak to those things. But are we getting kind of wrapped up in like the representation and not the lived experience that every day on the ground. So I was reading, like, I was reading her feminism, like, okay. <laughs> so this is also one of those ones that's going to be like, okay, okay. Um, mm -hmm. True, true. You got a good point there. You <laughs> so. And as we're talking about pleasure activism and this politic of pleasure, I want to ask the folks who are with us, if you feel comfortable on Facebook and on YouTube, what does the word pleasure evoke in your mind? Mm -hmm. um, because I think this book also causes us to interrogate what have we allowed ourselves to think of as pleasure? Um, how far have we let our minds imagine pleasure and how much pleasure do we take for granted? Mm -hmm. um, and that was a big piece of one of the last sections of the syllabus when she gets into talking about non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. Which is something I be talking to my friends all the time, like so non-monogamy, monogamy, how do we <laughs> how do we feel? Mm -hmm. How do we feel about it? And yeah. Brown really gets at first you have to define pleasure for yourself, for your partnerships or whatever. And you have to know that all relationships take work and discussion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Like you're just like you don't just to walk into a polyamorous or non-monogamous relationship and be like 
jealousy doesn't exist anymore. And I am just like this new person. It's like you work through those and you navigate them. And I think that like she has a commitment to ethical to ethics and having a set of ethics around anything that we do, but engaging in these practices ethically. So yeah. not gonna lie, I rarely associate with pleasure things outside of sex. And this is why pleasure activism is such a great book. Because while Brown does not shy away from discussions of sex, sexuality, um, and loving, she mm -hmm. also takes us to to realms that we often don't think about pleasure involving, like harm reduction, right? Pleasure and drug use, right? Right, whether it be taboo or you just haven't considered, like some people do drugs because okay. it feels good, right? Um, let me look through some of the other titles. There's discussions of Beyonce in here, moving beyond oh, yeah. desire, um, discussions of fear and shame. Mm. Yeah. So the different subsections are about political practice, um, feeling good, politics of radical sex, radical drug use, mm -hmm. and liberated relationships. In the liberated relationship section, does not focus on romantic relationships. The bulk of the discussion is on like child rearing and being a liberated, loving friend, which I really had to sit with, especially as a young 20 something, right? Like watching all of these shows in particular, I connected it to pop culture, uh -huh. like rereading this book and rewatching the last season of Insecure. Ooh, it's okay. like, some people need to, <laughs> to be honest about what pleasurable friendships look like. Right. I mean, this is off of a different point. Um, I didn't get a chance to read all of it, but I really like Alexis Pauline Gums. The, like, I felt like she was writing a love letter to all of her like black feminists, like people, like uh, mentors. I think it was mm -hmm. the one right before The Sweetness of Salt and Tony K. Bambara in The Practice of Pleasure and Five Tributes. Like even the, the, so she's giving these tributes to people who I think Tony K. Bambara's work has inspired or seeing them put into practice her, her politics or her particular articulation of pleasure politics. Mm -hmm. um, and so even those moments of just like gushing over like these people in your life um, and just paying them their due, I think that's also a part of, that feels good, you know? I'm gonna show this quote. Uh, uh, her quote, yeah. well, I can see it gets cut off, but her quote about drugs giving her instant happiness, joy, and how she needed that at moments when she couldn't find joy in anything else resonated with me heavily. Yeah. Mm. Somebody else said, anything that makes me feel good after my needs have been met. It's like when my cut runs over, that part runs over, it's pleasure for me, right? So pleasure could be getting to your wants and your desires. What does it mean going beyond needing and survival, especially right now? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for us to, to strive to have a pleasure politic in the middle of a pandemic, in an election year, and winter is coming mm. for so many people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this book, I, I'm not going to tell y'all that you need to go grab it, but that is what I'm saying. Yeah, I just have an earlier time. Everything from All About Love and Emergency Studies to my rewatch of Girlfriends. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially once you get into the later seasons of Girlfriends oh. and All About Love. Oh, yes. I know a few episodes. Um. And the all about love, like when the chapter you picked, uh, I thought it was so good. Love is a love is political resistance, because mm -hmm. even though she's drawn really heavily from Audre Lord, um, and I would say is this one, and and also Octavia Butler. Like I really, I was like, did she just like where where is all about love in here? Because I think like <laughs> after like radical honesty, like we could talk about. The chapter on honesty and lying, um, you know, building communities of care. We can go back to that chapter on communion, um, you know, healing the last chapter. I think it was the last chapter or like the last few chapters. And so like mm -hmm. reading these together and really also thinking about like a 2000 bell hooks 
what is Adrienne Marie Brown doing that is expanding on that too? And also how she's making space for our queer, our trans, our non-binary folks um, in the movement, in our communities, and how is she allowing us to see, to, to explode that and expand um, how people are thinking about pleasure, how people can Absolutely. access pleasure in our community. Absolutely. And I think that work that she does is very much rooted in lived experiences of movement and community. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another reason why I wanted us to look at this as complex theory so that we can understand what complex theory can look like. Like movement texts are complex theory just as a voice from the South yeah. is a theoretical text, right? Because theory and practice, right? We are this black feminist reading group. Theory and practice go hand in hand. The personal is political. All of these texts are showing us ways throughout our lives that we can engage in all of this, right? Like you read the theory and then you practice it, hopefully. Hopefully you read about radical honesty and you grapple with, why do I lie? Why was I taught to lie? And what does lying do for my community? Is it pleasurable when I lie? Who yeah. am I lying to? And it also allows you, and I think what this does is it allows you to adapt as you're moving. So like if the theory don't work or the praxis don't work for the theory, you are able to adapt mm -hmm. and kind of reimagine as you're moving throughout. And so, you know, sometimes we think of like what comes first, right? The theory or the, you know, and I really like to see it like play out and evolve. Um, right. And use them in tandem. Mm -hmm. Did we already put this comment up? Oh yeah, we did. Um, one of the things I mean, in general, I think what we're trying to get at is thinking about when we talk about struggles for liberation or liberation movements, one of the things I thought about was like, it doesn't mean suffering. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean like that pain. Like, I think you, um, in your convers your earlier conversation about Parable of the Soul, we're thinking about like, why are we not also engaging the, we're thinking about she's experiencing pain, but we're not yes. also thinking about pleasure as it's in relation to it, and does she experience both? And, you know, like I always go back to like black feminists, queer folk, like we can walk and chew gum, you know, like we can do both. At the same time. And like, <laughs> and that is what I really feel like this work does. It's like, it's like we can walk and chew gum. We can experience like, I mean, that is, I think about like the, the sort of phenomenon. <laughs> I don't know, even know if that's the way to say it, but Black Twitter is a very is a perfect example. Come on, being able to be able to like, do both, right? Like we can the way we have a critique. We can have a critique of what's going on and still laugh, and so you know, and still find joy. And so that's what pleasure activism, like for me, I think does is show me that there there are possibilities to exist in the world, but it's a way to put language to that because we do mm -hmm. it. It's happening, but we have a language for it now. And it gives you an entree into different people's work that can show you more of how to do that. Yeah. Right. Like this was one of the first introductions I had to Alexis Pauling Gums. And now I'm out here buying all of her quote, dub, M, spill. Mm -hmm. All of those yeah. are on the way in the mail, right? Yeah. From this text, from other work. And I think that's another benefit of when you get an anthology. Like Joan Morgan is in here. Audre Lorde is in here. Alexis Pauline Gums is in here. Mm -hmm. So many phenomenal thinkers, past, yeah. present, and I'm sure we're going to see more incredible things from them in the future, yep. are in this text. And so you're not only getting Adrian Marie Brown, but you're getting the people, the folks that she brought into the room with her. Mm -hmm. that she brings into all of our rooms when we crack this open and you can cherry pick or like open yourself up to the table of contents and just run your right. <laughs> run your finger and pick one close your eyes pick a pick a chapter and every time like I, I did that this morning I just picked one and uh the one that I came up on was the one about the vibrator <laughs> yes uh, um, and where she has a conversation with the womanizer. Um, but it was such a good, one of the things I wish I could find it. it was it 87? I wish I could read a little bit, but if I can't find it, I won't hold up the time. 
Um, but it was so good. And it was really like, basically what she was talking about is so how sometimes we don't really even know how to find pleasure within ourselves or for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times we depend on other people to provide us with that pleasure, um, whether it be sexual pleasure, whether it just be like emotional security, like all of these different things. And like, what does it mean to like know your body and know like what makes you tick or whatever? Mm -hmm. And um, and then how do you then go back into engaging in your relationships with an understanding of like, I know what makes me feel good. Yeah. And so I'll also say on that point of like practical application, this is a text that very similar to when people were reading heavy and they were on the Facebook group and they were like, I read heavy and then I had to go have a conversation with my mom yeah. and my partner and my friends from the neighborhood. Like this is another text that when I tell you different parts of this book will spark a conversation mm -hmm. with different people that you love and care for. Oh yeah. Yes. Man. And it's, and not all the conversations are these, um, they're not necessarily laborious, right? Because there are points in this book that are very loving and humorous. Like there's more than one um, entry that is just Adrian Marie Brown giving the audience like a one pager of thought yeah. on like, <laughs> whether it be the time she got really high or the time yeah. she had this affair with a lover. And it's like this short reprieve <laughs> in the middle of like an interview with one of her homegirls right. and an interview with this other scholar. And so you get very intimate moments and you yeah. read them and you want to take them elsewhere. You want to have that conversation. Like, do you have a homegirl who y'all have had a text message thread that looks very similar to this? Thank you. Yes. I'll watch it. Yes. And read and pick up the book. <laughs> but yeah, I enjoy it. It's like an experience. It's like, um, and it's a roller coaster of, of different things. And, you know, um, and just like the hot and heavy homework. Like, I really love your syllabus too, because I think it really does speak. I printed it off because I was like, you know, I'm a brain. Hey. I, I was at work using all my good ink at work. Um, <laughs> print this off. My colleague's probably going to be like, okay, so we're out of um, red one. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems uh, like we got to put in the HP ink order a little listen, bit sooner look, than we thought. What's the day? What happened? Look, somebody back here printing off too much stuff. But, and um, so, because I really did want to the workbook style of it is so important. Like when you're getting, when you have to sit with yourself and say, how do I define pleasure? List mm. five ways that you create pleasure in your life. Like, and having to really go there and be like, oh, I need to get my toolkit. What is my, and this will allow you to kind of say, okay, what is my, you know, we talk about yeah. care. Um, and also that's the other point I want to make about this is like, self-care gets taken up as, or mindfulness uh, gets taken up as like, did I take a bubble bath or did I pamper mm. myself? And I feel like we are moving into a space where we understand that it is also about setting boundaries and knowing what makes us feel good. And like also um, knowing our limits and our, you know, what in the things that we use, like this, you know, whether it be food or our relationship to food or our relationship to sex. So um, I think that's also a part of what self-care looks like. Um, and so she's really pushing us to say like, yeah, those things are a, a thing and it's a part of this work, but yeah. we are also talking about a spiritual and a full body experience that connects mind, body, spirituality, all of those things. And I love that you talk about self-care because I think that, that's something when people think about pleasure, they do go to that place. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't begin with that work from Audre Lorde, right? Like that is who we get the term self-care from, even though yeah. marketing and all of these different products don't often cite mm -mm. <laughs> our, our good ancestor. Mm -hmm. But she begins with uses of the erotic, right? And so she begins with uses of the erotic for this text, because I think as so many people have brought up in the chat is that when you hear pleasure, pleasure, eroticism and sex sort of go hand in hand right. in our imagination. 
but she takes us there. And I think she very um, masterfully builds on Lord's work of like mm-hmm. eroticism and sexuality are not synonyms. Mm-hmm. Sexuality is erotic, but there's so much else. Yeah. Eroticism is an energy. It's an embodiment. It's a, it's a use of yourself. It's an alignment. Mm-hmm. And I so love that you bring up the work style, the, the work and exercise style of the syllabus because that's what I was really going for because there are so, so, so many points um, when Adrienne Marie Brown gives the audience her own homework mm-hmm. at the end of section. Heavy homework. Mm-hmm. There are so many points where in conversation she's having with different people that she brought into the text that they are giving us different prompts to consider. Mm-hmm. Yep. From how do you feel in your sexual relationship with yourself and partners? How do you feel if you are a caregiver, especially to young children? How are you teaching young children to have pleasure? Because mm-hmm. that's something that I had to reflect on. And I had to like talk to my young self about like, how do we get here? How do we get to a, a politic of understanding our bodies? What were the lessons that we were taught in childhood about how to give ourselves permission or to withhold from ourselves. Mm -hmm. What is this messaging? It's racialized, it's class, it's gendered. And we have to name all of those things. And Adrienne Marie Brown doesn't shy away from those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like when we even talk about sex ed, I think there's something in here about sex education, um, maybe it's a poem, but even just when we we say, and also when we say the words like, what is a comprehensive like <laughs> sex education program? Like we say those things and they sound real good, but then like on this, like when we get down to it, does that also mean that we're talking about pleasure? Does that also mean that we're talking about um, queer people and how they? Yeah. Like, what is the sex education for queer folks? For for queer students? For non-binary people? For trans people? What is what does that look like? What is sex ed that doesn't have childbirth as the the end the finale look like right? childbirth or just childbirth like it's somewhere what happens when we sort of mold our or reshape our understanding of sex ed and sexual liberation to be about how do you feel in your body mm-hmm. do you know how your partners feel in their body yeah do you know how the people that you are interacting with feel about pleasure? Do y'all have conversations about how to feel good as a community? Mm-hmm. How do we feel good, feel better and get well as communities? How do we live a pleasure politic together beyond yeah. the individual? How do we help each yeah. other feel good? Right. I think that's the biggest it- piece that I think I had to really, I mean, just even joining this group and really like, understanding what community is and how like, you know, sometimes we think, I think I often think about community being like a whole bunch of people. And it's like, also like, what are your little tribes? What are your little core group of people? Because that is a community and how are you relating to those people? Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, I think sometimes we imagine, I always imagine like a village and I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that is one. But then also what, like, in our like immediate sphere of influence, who are those people and are we nurturing those relationships and are we doing this work together? Um, mm-hmm. Like I, I think Kiese, uh was talking about like, you know, doing the work in isolation. He was saying like, if I'm not good, if my community is not good, then I'm not good, you know? And so like, we have to really think about, I think also this work offers us a chance to share the work because if we're just reading it right like and we're not engaging it with people outside of the facebook group or the book club um how you know how beneficial can it be and so it really i think pushes us to kind of say sharing is caring absolutely in more ways than one (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) yeah And so as we come to our last few minutes of our discussion, I think a question I have for you is, um, after reading this book, what is one gem, one lesson of the many um, that you're actively practicing and working through? 
Ooh. Well, this is this is probably not even good. This is I, I really feel like I'm gonna end on like this. Like that wasn't really like about pleasure, but I think it's <laughs> about shaking the table, like of what we like, of, like even with Black feminism, which I feel like we've had like a couple of year, almost a decade, where Black feminists have really been taking up these questions of our sort of like our what what Joan Morgan is talking about, our trenchant like theories, the main ones that we kind of go to. And so I guess for me, it's about like saying it's a, it's okay to kind of interrogate the thing that we felt like we needed to justify for our safety and survival, mm. especially within the academy, like with Black feminism needing to be ge- like legitimized. We go back to Black feminist thought. And like, so in doing this, like how do we think about pleasure as a rigorous, like, and th- th- there is rigor in studying pleasure but also how do we step away from it and let and also let it exist without needing to theorize it like so there's that Mm. also that part about like we need to master i mean Brittany cooper talks about like mastering things and like having theory be a way of mastering whatever and so like how do we let pleasure exist on a plane as in and let it be like a like mindfulness is about like being and, and being present in that moment and like, what does that allow us to do when we just let things exist in the world without also needing to put tightly wound, wind things up? And I feel like that is what I'm taking away from it. Um, and also really just about being uncomfortable and being okay, uh, because that's a part of growth, like growing mm-hmm. new, literally. Um, it is okay to be uncomfortable in the work because that does show a transformation, even in, if in that moment it doesn't feel good. Absolutely. And your last point um, brings me to, to my sort of takeaway that I wanna settle on before we head out, is that it's okay to have questions that mm-hmm. persist. And this is a text along with Emergent Strategy, another Adrian Marie Brown text. Pleasure Activism is a text, I still have questions. Questions mm-hmm. are abundant. Questions yeah. mean, engaged, alive, taking things in, listening actively, experiencing. And it's okay for questions to persist. It's okay Mm -hmm. to not have it mastered to your first point. It's okay for you to not have an answer. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be to be fumbling through some things, right? As long as they're not harmful, as long as they're not violent or violating other people. There's okay to have moments of like, Maybe you pick up the syllabus and you're like, I can't name five. I can't name five practices. So you keep that question and it persists for you. And as you're going through your day-to-day life, you become more aware. Like maybe when it's Tuesday, right? Maybe Taco Tuesdays are something that you never thought to name as something that brings you pleasure. Right. Because that's another part of this text is it causes us to not stray away from the things that society tells us you shouldn't get pleasure from. Mm-hmm. including care work, which is another um, discussion interview in this text, that it's okay for things that have been gendered, that mm-hmm. have been sexualized, et cetera, to still be things that make you feel good. Like mm-hmm. if you want to give care to other people, give yourself permission to do that. And so I love so many things about this text. I love so many things about this conversation. Uh, you really just inspired me to go and look at different sections yeah. Tonight, before I go to sleep and, and reread, I think I'm going to reread the Alexis Pauline Gum oh, yeah. um, Ode to Tony K. Bambara. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, make sure you join in and read Pleasure Activism with us. Pick up the syllabus, dive into it, give it to your best friend, your auntie, uh, and start a conversation in your community. And buy the syllabus because it is the truth. All right. All right, y'all. Y'all have a good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.